Hey everybody, this is Dave from Let's Make a Game Together, and this is my little buddy Butters, yes from South Park, and we're going to teach you five ways to get started in indie game development. Aren't we buddies? Yes. Yes. So the first tip in getting started in indie game development is to just start copying. I know that sounds really bad, but there is no shame when you're starting out to make a Flappy Bird or do a tutorial on how to make Jetpack Joyride. Games like Flappy Bird, Jetpack Joyride are extremely popular and there is a million tutorials on YouTube on how to make these games and they're relatively simple games to make. But by doing something from the start to finish, and seeing the entire process, you will actually understand the concepts and what, what, what's actually involved in making a game. And by the end of it, you might actually be able to edit it yourself. So you might be able to make it so Flappy Bird, you're flapping through different types of pipes or the pipes fall down, or maybe, you know, you can add your own zing to it in the end. But the point is doing something from start to finish and having something that you've actually finished in a short amount of time can do wonders for your understanding about game development and can actually increase your confidence as a game developer. So there's absolutely no shame in copying uh, and cloning a video game to get started. Remember, you're learning, you're just learning, so it's all good. If you don't understand the coding, just copy what they're saying on the screen and eventually this stuff will start to get into your head and it'll start to get into your head and you'll start to you'll start to understand it but just slowly and surely just start copying what they're doing and that's that's a really really easy and quick way to get started okay se second tip is to get started by doing game jams now i know what you're thinking oh i don't know how to make a game how am i gonna do it do a game jam or like or you might be thinking what the hell is a game jam game jams are just small blocks of time you might have 48 hours or 72 hours. They're like competitions, usually online, that you have to make a game based around a theme using all your own stuff within a certain amount of time and then you put it out there for people to rate. So game jams are awesome because it's a, a, a fixed block of time where you're doing nothing else but creating video games. It's one of the best ways to stretch yourself. Now, the trick is you're gonna tell yourself that no matter what, you're going to release whatever you have at the end of the game jam for the entire world to see. Doesn't matter if it's broken, doesn't matter if it doesn't work, it, you're just going to release it. Because in doing that, you're actually telling yourself, oh crap, I need to get this done. I need to find a way to make the game that I'm doing um, actually work. Let me tell you a story about this. I think I've done seven or eight uh, Love and Dares. Um, I did one literally on a train from um, London to Edinburgh in five hours. I, I literally smashed out a game in five hours. Not a very good game, but I at least completed something. But there was this one year where I just couldn't for some reason get the game. My brain just stopped working in the last like, you know, 10 hours and I just couldn't get it to work. I was overtired and I just, just couldn't get it to work. But I made that promise to myself that no matter what, I'm going to release this game. So if you type in fail boy in fail world, I'm sure it'll come up. You'll literally find my game that is just doesn't work. It's broken. It's, 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 a, it's a disaster, right? It's like it literally doesn't. It's not a game. Um, but I uploaded it because I kept a promise to myself that no matter what, um, I'm going to release whatever I have at the end and it really puts a fire underneath you to actually get um, the other games out and guess what the other uh, the other seven times out of the eight times that I've done Love and Dare it's actually worked really well and I've learned a lot of valuable skills uh, when actually doing it. So number one find the next Love and Dare or the next game jam that that's close close enough to when you want to actually do it you're going to sign up it's free right and then you're going to lock in the time so that you can make sure that you can actually do the thing. Lock it in with your wife, lock it in with your um, your parents, lock it in with your um, school, lock it in with whatever. Do whatever you need to do to get that day off if you if you need to. And usually it's over a weekend, so it's all good. And the fourth thing you're going to do is you're going to release the game. You're going to release it no matter what. You're going to tell yourself, I'm going to release this game no matter what. When you jump into the jam, if you don't know what to do, um, what you're going to do is you're going to use youtube.com and you're going to search tutorials and you're going to follow tutorials and just fo do the things that you need to do to learn the skills you need to learn to get the game that you have in your mind out of your mind into the keyboard and into the game so other people can play it and that's what you're going to do and that's going to grow you faster than anything else so tip number three will go really really well with tip number one and tip number two and that is don't get overtaken by scope creep what is scope creep scope creep 
is the thing that makes you want to keep adding things to your game, keep increasing the scope of your game. Because you're like, oh, this would be really cool if you could collect diamonds as well as coins. Oh, this would be really cool if you could collect, you could do this. It'd be really cool if you could punch the enemies as well as jump on their heads. It could be really cool. And you keep adding more and more and more to the game until it, it becomes way, way more complicated than it needs to be. So how do you not get attacked by scope creep? How do you not get sucked down by the tentacles of scope creep until your game is just destroyed? Well, what you do is you do a technique that I call version 1.1 technique. And what is version 1.1 technique? And that is you start out with a basic concept of your game. So you go, this is what the game is. You write it on paper and any idea that you get, no matter how small that idea is, you go, ah, leave it for version 1.1 and you're just strict with yourself. You go, no, no, I'm not going to put that in. Even though it's really fun, I'm not going to put that in until we get to version 1.1, until the game is finished. And then after the game is finished, that's fine. I can add it then, but the game has to be finished before I add those extra things in. And this stops you from going too far with your game. This, this stops you from your game blowing out to being so big that it never gets finished. You need to start small, start tiny, Think cookie clicker, think flappy bird, tiny, 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 tiny. Think the most basic, most simple game that you can ever think of. Think maybe like you gotta you gotta pop the red balloons. Have you seen that um, Rick and Morty where um, the dad is like, you know, popping the red balloons? That that's simple, right? Think that. And then every time you feel like you need to add something more to it, oh maybe it'd be really cool if it no no no. Wait for version version 1.1. This will seriously save you guys so much heartache and so much headache because it doesn't matter. When you finish the game, that's cool. If you still want to add it, up, add it when you finish the game, that's awesome. But don't rein in your emotions. Don't let your emotions take control and just start adding things because your game will get blown out and you'll never finish your game or your game will just take longer and longer and longer. It'll get more and more complicated and then there'll be a million moving parts and you won't know what to do. So tip number three, think small and don't get attacked by scope creep. So tip number four might not be for everybody, but it's something that, that definitely helped me. So something that I did when I first started is I literally fell to sleep to programming tutorials. I had my laptop on the side of the bed and I would watch programming tutorials and I would just fall to sleep because watching someone's process and how they think and how they actually interact with, with uh, the coding and what they're actually doing, even though I didn't fully understand it, it actually started to sink into my brain. So what I would suggest doing is watching a few channels that inter interest you on game development and don't, don't, don't need to worry about about, about you know following every line of code that they do or anything just watch it like ent for entertainment wise and there are a few channels that I can highly highly recommend that I literally watch to this day just when I'm just needing to go to sleep or when I'm just chilling out and just want something on the TV when I'm cooking dinner or something or or when I'm just chilling chilling playing some you know Minecraft or something or playing a video game and I've got it on my second screen and that is one um, Brackies. Brackies is really awesome they have really cool videos that come out all the time the royalty in the game dev community online Quill 18 creates now Quill 18 creates is a really really cool dude got a really quirky personality really really interesting games and a really really interesting way that he approaches problems and I he, if there's any channel that I watch the most it was Quill 18 creates it's a lot of like strategy games and things like that um, is, is like what I watch like like to watch from Cool 18, he's just, he's the man. Then you've got Sebastian, Seba uh, I don't know how to say his last name, but it's on the screen. He is a mastermind programmer. I watch him when I want to get furious about how smart he is. You just watch stuff and you go like, man, I don't know how, I don't know what kind of school of Hogwarts witchcraft and wizardry you went to, to understand these like formulas, but he's a super smart dude and he does some incredible stuff inside of Unity and it's, I totally recommend um, checking him out. Another person that I've just found recently is Thomas Brush. He is an awesome, awesome indie game developer. He's just about to release his game Once Upon a Coma and he's fantastic at making um, just really easy watching content. This channel is a lot more creative and a lot more um, kind of artsy than the, the programmer channels that I, I normally watch and I really like to watch him when I'm just kind of just chilling and not really in the mood for like thinking too much and um, he also has a lot of really cool videos about how to get started in game development and how to get started into making 2D games and how to make platformers and stuff and he's really 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 I really recommend him he's really awesome but he comes from a more of an artsy side and it's just fantastic and the last channel is a channel I haven't watched in a while because I just 
binged it for so long that I've seen most of their content. Um, but Extra Credits, they're an amazing like YouTube channel, cartoon style, that goes through game design principles and they're really, really, really good. Um, I would definitely recommend checking them out if you're interested in game design. So we've got game design, um, Extra Credits, um, Thomas Brush, he does a lot of art and also programming, but more on the artsy side of things. And then you've got um, the programmers, Quill 18, Brackies is also a good programmer, and Sebastian, if you just want to tear your hair out wondering what kind of witchcraft he uses to get how, how smart he is smarting smart. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, so tip five is a pretty obvious tip, and it may seem similar to the last tip, but it's, it's a little bit different. And that is sign up for an actual course online. Now, I know that that sounds exactly similar to doing a YouTube tutorial or, or, or whatever, but I, I wanna stress the importance of actually doing a full course rather than watching just the, the old random YouTube video. The difference between like YouTube or just tutorials that you find online and ones that you actually pay for is the level of one, polish and a level of support. When you upload a course to Skillshare or Udemy, it has to pass certain check marks. You can't upload garbage. It has to actually work. So you know that you're getting a, a product that's actually good when you when you buy a course on Udemy or Skillshare and you know it's going to have a good support network. So for me, when I get a, a comment on my courses on Udemy and Skillshare, I make sure I respond as soon as possible and I do everything I can to help that person because I know they're going to give me a good rating and I know that that rating is going to affect the sales of my courses. So it's in the teacher's best interest to make sure you have the best time, right? It's not the same with YouTube and it's not the same with any other other courses that you don't pay for online. So something that I didn't understand when I was a lot younger is the perception of money and time. So let's say that I don't want to pay for a course on Udemy because it costs like 15 bucks, let's say, for example, right? I'm like, I'm not paying $15. That's that's too much money. I don't want to do that, right? So then I spend the entire weekend. Let's say I spend 15 hours over a weekend just, just trying to work out a problem, right? I've essentially, if I just paid for that course and just actually done the course, I would have learned how to do those things and then not had to like pull my hair out over a weekend. And it's cost me $15. So by not doing that, by, by tearing at my hair all weekend, I've essentially paid myself one dollar an hour. It's just, it's just completely stupid. You gotta also value your time. So I would definitely recommend going to Skillshare or going to Udemy and just searching out courses. And if, if one takes your liking and you can afford to, to sign up, then yeah, sign up and, and do it. If you wanna sign up for Skillshare and you haven't got a Skillshare account at the moment, if you use the link down in the description, you can sign up for free for two months and I get to get um, a bonus for you signing up and you can actually do my course. I've got a course in there and it's all free for the first two months and you'll easily be able to smash it out in two months. Um, so it costs you absolutely nothing and 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 you can also do every other course as, as well uh, on Skillshare or you can sign up for Udemy as well. So that's the last tip that I wanna, wanna give away is do courses. Thanks for checking out this video. If you have any tips of your own where you could help someone who's starting out that, that may be a bit, bit further behind than you, then leave the, a comment in the description down below and let me know what your um, your tips are on getting started in indie game development or what you've done. And if you are just starting out and you do create something, send, tell us about it. Tell us about it in the YouTube YouTube um, comments. I'll definitely love to read it. Definitely love to check out your work. Uh, hit us up on Patreon You can um, if you want to support the channel. I mean, Twitter, YouTube, like, favorite, subscribe, do all those things or I'll punch you in the throat. And thank you so much. And uh, yeah, see you later guys. Peace. You good? You good? You gotta be for the camera. You're my clickbait. Oh. Hey everybody, this is Dave from Let's Make a Game Together.